uh, video series, and we're going to go much slower, <laughs> much more detail. The book we just passed out, The Long War Against God by Henry Morris, is just an excellent book. Um, one of the best I've ever seen, tracing the history of evolutionary thought. See, evolution didn't start with Charles Darwin. It started with Satan in the Garden of Eden. And he traces it up through all the different Eastern religions and everything else. And uh, I want you to turn to page 60, because last week we were talking about how evolution and racism tie together. By the way, the book is normally 13 bucks in, in softback. It's enlisted in our catalog. It has hardback for like $21. I think our cost is like 10. If you're in the class and you want to get one for 10 bucks, you're welcome to do that. Well worth reading. I would say one of the top 10 books I've ever read. This would be, this would be it. It's that good. Um, I've only read 11 books. Um, page 60, it covers how all the people were racist at the time when evolution became a popular theory. Last week we left off talking about how the aborigines, you know, were persecuted and, and, and slaughtered just because they were uh, aborigines. They thought they were inferior. How many have seen the movie Quigley Down Under, you know, where the marksman goes to Australia and they hire him to come down there and start shooting these aborigines? They, people really did that. They would round them up and shoot them like cows. One of the arguments that the evolutionists had was the aborigines are inferior because their jaws are bigger. Here's a picture of an Eskimo jaw. Uh, the head of the jaw is much thicker. And a dentist would look at this and say, wow, what did this guy eat? Well, Eskimos, like the Aborigines, you know, are nomadic, and the Aborigines travel around. They don't have homes, and they don't, have, they don't want to carry a toolbox around everywhere they go. So they use their teeth constantly as a vice, or as a pliers, or as a scissors, or whatever. To, you know, that's one of their primary tools, okay? And so they're always holding things, like you want to strip the meat off the bone, you clamp the bone in your teeth and pull the meat off, or strip the bark off a tree branch for something. That's your vice, okay, your portable vice. Any bodybuilder will tell you, the more you use the muscles, the bigger the bones grow. As you pull on the muscles, well, you can see from here, you know, uh, the, uh, <laughs> the muscle pulls on the bone. The bone responds by sending a message to the brain saying, look, you better send some more material down here. We've got to build this muscle, this bone stronger to withstand this pressure. Now, of course, it's a much slower process. You know, you can build up bigger muscles quickly, but bigger bones take longer. But people really do get bigger bones as well as bigger muscles. Ask any biology teacher or go to any, you know, uh, Gray's Anatomy, we'll talk about that, I believe. But the, because the Eskimos and the Aborigines use their teeth all the time for a vice, their jaws are actually thicker and heavier duty than the average person. Some have argued that wisdom teeth, I got a letter the other day, said wisdom teeth are proof of evolution. I wrote back and I said, well, there's a couple of flaws in your thinking. First of all, wisdom teeth is losing something, not gaining something, you know. Secondly, if man used to develop slower when God first created the world, you know, 6,000 years ago, they might have been, you know, didn't enter their teenage years until they're 20. And, you know, didn't uh, get married until they're 60. I mean, all you got to do is look at the dates in the Bible. So I think it was just a long, slow, lazy childhood, delayed maturation. Another factor to consider, there was so much to learn. You know, think how many plants and herbs and uses, you know, Adam was pre-programmed with, or from, learned from talking to God, and then Adam had to pass this knowledge on to his kids, and they have to pass it on to their kids. I mean, in one sense, I learned so much from my dad. It was just incredible. You know, we built houses together and did worked on cars together, and uh, even when he was, you know, 70 years old, it was neat to talk to him because he knew so many things. It's like, wow, I didn't know that. Dad, you know, here. <laughs> you know, 35 and he's 70 and it's like, oh, dad, that's, that's neat. I didn't know you knew that. Um, well, Adam lived to be 900 plus came pre-programmed. So I just suspect before the flood came, I don't have a chart up here, but before the flood came, the people were developing much slower. You were a kid for 20 or 30 years. No, not a care in the world. Enjoy life, a lot to learn, you know, but just basically have a wonderful time enjoying God's creation. So, if the people were before the flood were eight, nine, ten feet tall, like we covered on uh, seminar part two of our series, that there's certainly some indication that they might have been, at least some were that big, their jaws are bigger, now you have room for that extra tooth. It's not a problem. The only reason it's a problem today is because we're probably genetic dwarfs compared to what we used to be. You know, the chihuahuas and the, the pug, and the little dogs that they've bred to be real tiny, have all sorts of problems because the gene pool is still trying to 
make them grow something bigger that is not, there isn't room in their body now. Well, that's what the wisdom teeth are. <laughs> they're, they're the opposite of evolution. They're proof of a much better original creation. So the Aborigines, though, were, were hunted, they were killed, they were enslaved, they were treated just like animals. Some missionaries tried to work with them and, and did an amazing job. I mean, many Aborigines were saved, got uh, civilized, whatever that word means, and uh, uh, made great Christians. There are Aborigines churches over there today in Australia. They are not an inferior species. They have a different lifestyle. You know, they prefer not having the, like the guys that live under the bridges, you know. Half the guys that live under bridges, that's what they want. They're homeless because they don't want to have bills to pay. They like the freedom from, from responsibility. And there have always been folks like that, you know. They'd rather go off in the woods hunting all their life, you know, and, you know, be the mountain man, Daniel Boone kind of guy. Um, so I think, well, we'll get into more of that later about the Ice Age in Seminar Part 6, if we ever get that far. But look on page 61 at the top in Henry Morris's book. It was not only Darwin and Huxley, the two top evolutionists who were racists, all of them were. This fact has been documented thoroughly in a key book by John Haller, appropriately called Outcasts from Evolution. One reviewer of this book said, This is an extremely important book, documenting as it does, what has long been suspected an ingrained firm and almost universal racism of North American men of science during the 19th and into the 20th century. Uh, ad ab in nitio. Afro-Americans Afro Afro were viewed by these intellectuals as being in certain ways unredeemable, unchangeable, irrevocably inferior. This is what they said. The quote we read last week, Turn, go to the bottom of page 60, just before that. This is what Huxley said. We only read part of the quote last week. No rational man, cognizant of the facts, believes that the average Negro is the equal, still less the superior of the white man. And if this be true, it is simply incredible that when all his disabilities are removed and our prognathous relative has a fair field and no favor as well as no oppressor, he will be able to compete successfully with his bigger-brained and smaller-jawed rival in a contest which is to be carried on by thoughts and not bites. In other words, if it involves biting or, you know, strength-type contest, they might be better, but if it involves thinking, the white man is better. That's what he's saying right here. That was the attitude of the 1800s. Now, racism has existed all through history, of, sure, of course, but Evolution is the only way you can justify racism because the Bible says very clearly we're all descended from Adam and then later all from Noah's family. How on earth can one race be superior? Scripture certainly does not teach racism. Uh, it does, it, God did tell the Jews only to marry other Jews, not to marry outside. And there may be a lot of reasons for that, but I'm Norwegian, my wife is Irish. Is that an interracial marriage? You know, There's certainly no scriptural reason to not have a black and white person marry. There's no scripture against that at all. There is only one race. There's only one race, the human race. They're different colors, but there's only one race. I think in some, se in some segments of society, it may be, you know, really, really hard on the kids. And that's unnecessary to do that, you know. So, uh, but there's, I wouldn't, you know, if a, we had a black guy working for us for a while. His wife was white, great couple, loved the Lord, moved on, teaches, teaches school now in Tennessee, you know. Um, it's probably for a long time, maybe forever, going to be some kind of racial, you know, stigma in America at least, in some parts of the world. But, you know, I don't think it's necessarily the wisest thing to do. But there's no scripture against it whatsoever. Okay, so evolution didn't cause racism. Evolution justified racism. Okay, in 1904, the World's Fair was held in St. Louis. That'll be a good quiz question. At the St. Louis World's Fair, if you go to the St. Louis Zoo today, you can still see many of the buildings and uh, places where this. They, after they had the World's Fair, they gave this area to the zoo and, and or science center, I believe, in St. Louis. The buildings are still being used. Um, one of the displays had 2,000 what they called primitive people on display to demonstrate their lack of evolutionary progress. Indians were put on this display, pygmies from Africa. There was a whole pygmy village set up at the St. Louis World's Fair in 1904. Dead or? Alive. They had them living there you know, doing their little things, you know, making their stone tools, and people would come by and watch them. Oh, isn't that cute? You know, what a shame. He's so, he's so inferior. He's so stupid. If only he wasn't black. If only he was like us white people. <laughs> wow. I mean, that's what was, and that's in America, in St. Louis, 1904. Um, uh, anthropologists designed the entire display. Ota Benga was one of the pygmies from Africa. He was taken away from his wife and two children and put in a cage with chimpanzees. 
He lived with the chimpanzees, not all the time. He got out, you know, from time to time. But uh, he got converted. Somebody led him, led him to the Lord. Uh, but he just never could get over this stigma. Oh, you're the guy that was in the cage with the monkeys. Ha, ha, ha. He ended up killing himself, committed suicide. This attitude, though, even into the 1900s, even into the last century, was um, because of evolutionary thinking. Theodore Roosevelt, as good a man as he was, and he was a great godly man in many ways, okay, and a, certainly a great patriot in many ways, um, he was strongly influenced by the evolution theory. He believed the inf Indians were an inferior species. Most people believed that back in those days. And if you look at some of the old westerns, you know, they often called the Indians savages. And they portrayed them as, you know, wicked, evil savages. Really, there are very few movies about the Indians that portray them as the good guys. It's almost always the bad guys. I can remember as a kid growing up, you know, we played cowboys and Indians. Uh, it's just, everybody did. I'm, you know, back in your era, if it's that way or not, but... Um, the movie Dances with Wolves is, you know, one of the few movies that portrays the Indians as the good guys and the white, white people as the bad guys. Um, it just is sad that what happened. We visited in Arizona and uh, right near the Four Corners, an Indian reservation, and I have spent, oh, I don't know, quite a bit of time, I guess, talking with Indians and discussing their religions and their, their beliefs and stuff like that. There still today is a stigma with some people versus the Indians. Some people still think they're inferior for some reason. You know, genetically inferior. And what's happened because of the, the dumb things we did to the Indians back in the you know, 1800s, it's about like the welfare for the black people or for uh, primarily the black people. It has just destroyed their, uh, their work ethic in many cases. It's destroyed their, their character, destroyed their families because, it, you know, they don't have a father in the home. And 65%, I believe now, of black births are illegitimate. 65? 73, you heard today? Um, the welfare has destroyed their, the whole black culture. Um, I remember as a kid, we had you know, friends that were black and they were hard working like everybody else, you know? And took care of their family like they're supposed to, you know? It's just, it's so sad. And that's what happened to the Indians. So many of them now, when I was down in uh, Chen Li, uh, Arizona, and in Farmington, New Mexico, uh, for a couple of weeks working with the Indians there, a large percentage of them are alcoholics. They get their monthly paycheck and go drink till they run out of money. The, the man has no purpose, you know, in the family. So he's a drunk and mom raises the kids. It's a matriarchal society. Welfare does that. Thomas uh, uh, Roosevelt said, Theodore Roosevelt said, I wish very much that the wrong people could be prevented entirely from breeding. And when the evil nature of these people is sufficiently flagrant, this should be done. What's he saying there? You should sterilize them. And by the way, in the early 1900s, there was a lot of this going on. Many mental institutions would take people that they thought were mentally retarded, sterilize them. So they wouldn't have children. I mean, thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, this happened to. Lots of people, just forced sterilization. Roosevelt went on to say, criminals should be sterilized and feeble-minded persons forbidden to leave offspring behind them. The emphasis should be laid on getting desirable people to breed. This is exactly what happened with Adolf Hitler's thinking. We are desirable. And we happen to be the desirable people, so you know, let's kill everybody else or prevent them from breeding. Many, many Jews, if they weren't executed, were sterilized during uh, the concentration camp era, World War II. Let's go on here. Roosevelt said, uh, this, this book from Bob Jones University says, this statement was not made by a Nazi in the 1930s, but in 1913 by American patriot Theodore Roosevelt. Although he was a great leader in other ways, he was, he with most of American upper middle class in the early 1900s, thought that the many immigrants from Europe, Scotland, Ireland, and the Orient were a threat to American society. Well, how many of you have one of your ancestors as an immigrant from one of those places? You know, <laughs> just about everybody in the room, right? Sure. Um, but they were really concerned that they were a threat to American society. Actually, in 1871, Congress officially scrapped all treaties with the Indians and moved them off to the reservation system that is still in effect today. But even before 1871, the Indians, of course, were being mistreated. Uh, I don't know when Geronimo was finally captured. Does anybody know he's held down here at Fort Pickens? In the, as, that was his prison for a while. 
1890, would that have been? Or I don't, I could look it up, Geronimo. But the Indian Wars really are just really a hundred, well over 100 years ago. There were still serious problems, you know, uh, with, on the frontier. Um, 1871, the Congress scrapped all treaties. Now before that, back in 1820, 30, 40 era, somewhere in there, I don't remember, the Trail of Tears incident took place. The Cherokee Indians, which lived mostly around uh, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia. You know the cave we went in, Eric, right on the Alabama-Georgia border? You drive by it all the time on the way to uh, Chattanooga. Cave, uh, Sequoia Cave. Sequoia Cave was the headquarters, or was one of the places where the Cherokee Indians met. One of their great chiefs was Chief Ross. He taught all of his, his people how to read. They made up a Cherokee alphabet with, I think, like 80 characters because each had 80 different sounds in the Cherokee language or something like that. He taught them all how to read in just a matter of a few months. Made, 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 here they were, uh, people with an unwritten language, just a spoken language. He gave them an alphabet, gave them a written language, and taught them to read. They were filling in, fitting in just fine with the white society around them. You know, you might have an Indian neighbor next door, and nobody thought anything about it. But... <clears throat> Sam Houston was married to a Cherokee Indian. I believe I have the facts straight. It's been a while since I read this, but uh, Congress voted to move the Cherokees out to Oklahoma to make room for the white man. One famous uh, town was called Ross's Landing, I believe the name of it was. All the Cherokees were moved out. On the forced march, it was interesting, they scheduled it so that the property would be taken over about two weeks before harvest time. So the Indians did all the work, planted the crops, you know, plowed the land, raised the crops, got them just ready to harvest, and they're forcefully moved out. I mean, soldiers came in with guns, loaded them on wagons, and moved them to Oklahoma. It's called the Trail of Tears. Went right through Cherokee Pass, Arkansas. You know, we stopped there at the gas station at Cherokee Pass all the time. Right through Imboden, Arkansas, where the Trail of Tears went. One third of them died along the way. Sam Houston was just enraged with what Congress was doing. They renamed the city that was Ross's Landing, I think was the name of the city originally. Again, you can go back and look up and do research on this. But So people would forget about what happened to the Cherokees. They renamed the city Chattanooga, Tennessee. That's where you went to school. Um, it's quite a history there. The tr you won't understand what happened to the Indians, though, until you understand how evolution ties in. Now, the Trail of Tears happened before Charles Darwin wrote his book. And I had an atheist write me a letter saying, you're so stupid, don't you know the Trail of Tears happened before Darwin's book was even written? Well, he's the one that's stupid if he thinks Darwin started evolution. <laughs> it started way before that. Okay, Darwin stole most of his ideas from his grandfather, Erasmus Darwin. Um, no, I understand the Trail of Tears happened before Darwin's book came out. But still, what happened to the Indians was a result of the racism, which it can only be justified by a theory like evolution. The Bible is very clear in Malachi chapter 2, have we not all one father? Hath not one God created us? Why do we deal treacherously every man against his brother? I worked for 17 years driving a bus every Sunday and often Wednesday in an all-black neighborhood for church, bringing kids to church. When we were going to the campus church over here, I personally brought 50 to 60 kids every Sunday night in my van to Awanas. I would make five or six trips down to the uh, Escambia Arms, to the ghetto, you know. People say, aren't you afraid to go in there? Well, I, I suppose a little bit, but man, I, I enjoyed, and still enjoy, meeting with black people. They're, they're friendly. You go to the door, you knock on the door, hey, come on in. They've never seen you in their life. They'll invite you in. People will talk to them, they'll have, ask you for supper, you know, all kinds of stuff. Just, I've, I've knocked on who knows how many doors as, you know, an avid soul winner for 30-some years now. But I really enjoyed working in the black neighborhood. But one night, I couldn't sleep, so about 2 in the morning I got up and I went down to my, my bus route in Texas, Longview, Texas. Um, one of the, uh, some drunk had been driving late that night and turned, I thought he was going down the street, and instead he turned down the railroad track. He drove a short distance down the track, car bottomed out, stuck on the rails, you know. So several people stopped and I saw the commotion, so I stopped my car. And we're trying to help push this car off of this railroad track before some train comes along, you know. And, of course, the drunk guy standing there by the car wondering, well, you know, what's going on around here? And uh, I got talking to this guy. We're trying to push this car off the tracks, you know. And he says, what are you doing out here in this neighborhood? He said, that's all black neighborhood over there. 
I said, oh yeah, I know. I know most of those folks. You know, They ride my bus to church. I come in here all the time, visit with them, love them. He said, church? What do you take them to church for? I said, well, we get them saved, you know, and teach them how to love the Lord and serve God and do what's right. He said, saved? He said, black people don't have souls. I said, are you part of the KKK? He said, yeah, how'd you know? I went, just a lucky guess, you know. I don't know if all KKK members believe that, but this guy did, and a lot of them do. That black people are animals. They don't have a soul. Now, where on earth would an idea like that come from? The evolution. They haven't evolved far enough. The white man is superior. The Bible says in uh, Acts chapter 17, and hath made of one blood all nations of men to dwell on the face of the earth. Now, there are definitely distinct characteristics of the different racial groups, if you want to call them racial groups, okay? No question, all right? Uh, I've dealt with the Japanese when I was in Japan, and they're you know, often very polite, very sweet, very mild-mannered, very humble, but there's kind of a pride because they're humble, you know? And they resist the American gospel in many, way, many ways. I was over there, and churches will, pastors will work there for 20 years to get a church of 10 people. They just, they don't want it. They look at American news, everybody's killing everybody. They don't have that problem in Japan. I mean, they're 10 times more crowded than we are. You know, and their crime rate is way down. They don't want what we got. You want us to accept American gospel? No thanks. You know, <laughs> we don't want what you've got. So different racial groups, no question, have <laughs> certain characteristics about them. You know, the Indians with the high cheekbones, the Norwegians with the blonde hair, etc., etc. But we're all descended from Adam and then later from Noah's family. So there's no reason to be a racist. Darwin said, a married man is a poor slave, worse than a Negro. Now, I won't ask how many of you agree with that statement, but the fact is, if a, prof <laughs> if a professor said that today, how long would he keep his job? Or his life? Yeah, not long. Yeah, not long, right? And yet Darwin is touted in schools as one of the great, you know, heroes, one of the great scientists of the world. He was a racist. He was a woman hater. He finally married his first cousin. Nobody else would take him, apparently. Darwin wanted to raise a race of, of purebreds, you know, great, you know. He saw, thought if you marry close to the family line, he thought, you know, since I'm so great, I'll marry somebody closely related to me. And we'll produce, you know, super kids. Well, it <laughs> didn't work. Okay, you get a bunch of rednecks when you do that these days. Um, Darwin... <laughs> yeah, we'll get to that in a minute. Darwin said, <coughs> The chief distinction in the intellectual powers of the two sexes is shown by man's attaining to a higher eminence in whatever he takes up than can woman. Whether requiring deep thought, reason, or imagination, or merely the use of the senses and hands, the average of mental power in man must be above that of women. See, after Darwin wrote his book, uh, Origin of Species, he later wrote another book called The Descent of Man. He actually wrote several books, okay? Progressively more atheistic. In his first edition of uh, Origin of the Species, the, you can tell which edition you're reading by looking at the last sentence in the book. First edition says, it ends with the words, you know, by, I forget the whole paragraph now, but uh, you can tell by this progression of animals or something that these, these things were created. Then in the second or third edition, they changed it to evolved. And there were six editions, I believe, altogether. And the first one, or at least the first one, maybe the first two, have the word created in there. Then they took that out. Wow. became evolved. But in his book, Descent of Man, <coughs> Darwin also said on page 588, Thus man has ultimately become superior to woman. Poetry, strength, voice, etc. Darwin believed in inbreeding. He married his maternal father's granddaughter, who was also his mother's niece which makes her his first cousin, okay? Which is illegal in all but three states here in America. The best man in my wedding, good friend of mine through school, went to a church that believed a few things a little strange, and uh, they had to marry somebody of their own faith. Well, there aren't many of that particular, you know, kind of real narrow faith, so he married his first cousin. He had to go to North Carolina to do it, I believe. Only a few states allow first cousin marriages. Almost all states, it has to be at least second cousin or further distant, just so you don't have genetic problems. Here's what happens. The uh, chromosomes in your body is like a ladder from here to Chicago. You know, it's twisted up. Okay? Each rung of the ladder is called a gene. 
and there are millions and millions and millions of them. Man currently has about at least 3,500 defective genes. Kind of like in your computer, you may have a, a program that's you got a bad file. Well, the computer can work anyway, okay? You might have a few broken wrenches in your toolbox, but you can still, you know, work with stuff. And there are about 3,500 defective genes in the average human gene pool. If you marry close, close to your bloodline, the probability of the same genes being defective are very high. So you are more likely to produce deformed children. That's just though it's a Russian roulette with three bullets in the chamber, you know. Not a good way to do it. Um, Darwin married his first cousin, okay? He wanted to produce a superior stock. This is from the book In the Minds of Men by Ian Taylor, which is also just an awesome book. I mean, it's huge, but we sell it through our ministry and it's just a tremendous book. Uh, they had 10 children. Mary died shortly after birth. Anne died at age 10. Robert was born retarded and died at 19 months. Henrietta had a serious breakdown at age 15. Three of his other six sons were ill so often, Charles regarded them as semi-invalids. That's your race of thoroughbreds. That's your race of thoroughbreds, all right. Okay. Ask anybody that raises cats or dogs or anything, if you allow them to breed back very, very close to the family line, you start to get some real strange things happening. You know, a lot of the hybrid dogs, Chihuahuas, for instance, you know, they're schizo. Run around, yip, 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 all day long. The only cure is duct tape or a ball bat, you know. Shut up, dog, okay? Uh, I don't recommend that. I've never done that to a dog. Some skeptic's going to get this tape and say, oh, Hovind believes in beaten dogs. Okay? No, I don't. Uh, oh. <coughs> All right, so racism ties right in. Look on page 61 here. This uh, whole section is about how the evolutionary theory in the book of Long War against God, how the evolutionary theory and racism just go hand in glove. Now, evolution didn't cause racism, and racism didn't cause evolution, but they certainly support each other. Okay? Um, all through here you see quotes by major evolutionists um, about how racism and how all the major evolutionists of the 1900s were racist, which was acceptable. I mean, we still had white bathrooms and black bathrooms here in the South just 40 years ago, right? You'd see signs, colored only. Pekin, Illinois, right near where I grew up, we've been through Pekin a thousand times, you know, used to have signs on the edge of the city Black man, don't let the sun set on you here. That's in my lifetime. The town we were in uh, yesterday, Eric, you know, they don't allow blacks. Still, today, <laughs> 2001, you know. There was one black kid at church last night, wasn't there? Yeah, the only black one in the whole town. And... Uh, Miles away. Oh, lived along. They had to bust them in. <laughs> yeah. Jay Florida had a sign like that. Till not long ago. Wow. Well, yeah, the KKK is still real strong, you know, in some areas. Um, that type of mentality, though, that because of a person's skin, he's inferior. Well, that's just flat stupid. Okay. Uh, there's no scientific evidence to back that up, and that's just that drives prejudice, you know, into people. Uh, and that just is sad that so many kids are raised with thinking that, you know. Dad teaches them that, and so they're going to believe it. Uh, okay. Now you can read through this if you'd like. Look at the quote in the middle of page 62, though. The Negroid stock is even more ancient than the Caucasian and Mongolian, as may be proved by an examination not only of the brain and of the hair, of the bodily characteristics such as teeth, genitalia, the sense organs, but the instincts. The intelligence. The standard of intelligence of the average adult Negro is similar to that of the 11-year-old youth of the species Homo sapien. This is Henry Fairfield Osborne that was on the quiz from last week, the curator at the American Museum of Natural History. He was the guy who was going to introduce, uh, this was one of the things they were going to introduce as evidence in the 1925 Scopes Monkey Trial. He was the guy going to bring in uh, Piltdown Man as evidence for evolution at the Scopes Monkey Trial. This is Henry Fairfield Osborne, who was a big brand name evolutionist of his day. Now, evolutionists today have worked very hard to distance themselves from this kind of teaching. They will usually say, yes, they taught that a hundred years ago, but we don't believe that anymore. And that's, uh, hopefully that's correct, okay? 
But the fact is, this is, a, this is just history. This is the way it was. Okay? Racism and evolution go hand in glove. Okay, let's uh, talk a little bit about how evolution is the foundation for communism. Switch gears here, all right? Before we do that, though, racism, of course, is a great way to get some people to kill other people. Great way. And that's one of Satan's goals. Lower the population to zero. Kill everybody. Now, God doesn't allow Satan himself to do it, so Satan has to get some of his assistants to do the dirty work for him. And so one of Satan's goals is get people to kill other people, and that's racism is a great way to do it, and evolution ties right into that. Okay, let's see how communism <coughs> uh, goes, to, goes, goes in with uh, evolution. Humanist Manifesto was written in 1933. Good quiz question. That's the first Humanist Manifesto. They wrote a second one in 1973. Basically says a lot of the same stuff. Okay. Humanists here are declaring that they are a religion. Over and over in the Humanist Manifesto, which you can still buy from Prometheus House, I believe is the name of the publisher, wherever that's at. I forget, I've got Humanist Manifesto in my library. But uh, <clears throat> um, they start off by saying, you know, uh, this is religious humanists. All through this document, they call themselves religious humanists. The courts have declared humanism is a religion. Humanism, basically, there's only two choices, okay? Two kinds of religions in the world, if you can call it that. There are those that say there's a God, and He tells us what's right and wrong. Now, who that God is? Is it Allah or Buddha or Jehovah? You know, they, all, all kinds of them. Okay. Uh, we believe we've got the right one. Of course, they believe they've got the right one. But the fact is, there are those religions who teach there is a God, and He decides right from wrong. And all we've got to do is find out what He wants and do it. Other religion says there's no God. If there is no God, then who's in charge? That's basically the question. Who is in charge? Now, we will see later how important this question is when we see what's happening with the New World Order and with uh, uh, our money supply, Federal Reserve notes. We're going to, get, going to get into a lot of interesting things. Redeeming the straw man, income tax, uh, which is voluntary, by the way, for most Americans, which we'll get into later. That's why I said this class is going to be very politically incorrect. I happen to strongly believe God's in charge. He owns this place. If there is no God, though, that brings up an interesting question. You know, who's in charge? I asked an atheist student one time in Pennsylvania. He sat in the school, in the class, when I, uh, in the auditorium, when I spoke to the auditorium there in Pennsylvania. He said, Mr. Hovind, I'm an atheist. I said, really? He said, yeah, there is no God. I said, well, then tell me, son, uh, how do you decide right from wrong? He said, that's easy. He said, I decide what's right and wrong because, he said, I couldn't believe he said this, he said, I'm the God of my own universe. I said, man, I'm glad to hear that, son, because I'm going to shoot you in five minutes. He said, you can't do that. I said, oh, yeah, I can. You see, I'm the God of my own universe. You know, if evolution is true, then man is God. We're it. That's exactly what humanism says. Humanism basically says, look, there is no God, therefore man is God. We have evolved the farthest, so we decide what's right. This didn't start with Charles Darwin by a long shot. The history in this book is so good about that. Um, Henry Morris goes clear back to uh, talking about even guys like Aristotle and Plato, who had their chain of being. You know, man is at the top. Under that is woman. Under that is animals. And if a man doesn't study philosophy, he'll come back as an animal. And if he's a cowardly man, he'll come back as a woman when he gets reincarnated. You know, <laughs> something like that. It was so stupid. But the whole thing is this chain of being where man is the ultimate authority. This is the foundation idea behind democracies. Let's get all the people together and let's vote on what's right and wrong. Well, that whole thinking is fundamentally flawed. If there's a God, then God decides what's right and wrong. We don't get together and decide right and wrong. And a lot of politicians, you know, try to decide right from wrong by 
you know, which way is the wind blowing? You know, how do you tell <laughs> which way is most of you going? Majority opinion is a dumb way to tell right from wrong. You got to have a book. Thus saith the Lord. This is right. This is wrong. If you don't have that, you really have a problem. You're like a ship in a storm with no anchor and no sail, no direction, no compass, no way to tell what's right and wrong. And that's the problem in America today, and that's the problem with American kids today. They don't have a guide and a compass. Here's how I tell right from wrong. Kids that are raised in Christian homes don't always turn out right, but most of them at least know there's a right and a wrong, and they know why. Now, whether they choose it or not is another story. But kids that are raised with the humanist idea that, you know, man is God, how, how are they going to tell right from wrong? Maybe that's why there's such a high percentage of immorality, premarital sex, you know, abortion, divorce, on and on and on. Go back to seminar part one, you know, all the evils. So, humanist manifesto, number one. This is the first tenet. This is what they start off. I think there were ten planks in their manifesto, or, or ten tenets. First one, humanists regard the universe as self-existing and not created. Well, guess what that says? There's no God. Therefore, that makes us God. We're in charge. That's the Humanist Manifesto, plank number one. Communism and humanism and evolution are triplets. Okay, they all go together. You can't have communism without evolution. Uh, last week I spoke in six different Russian churches in, uh, where was I? Portland, Oregon, and uh, Vancouver, Washington. Um, the Russian whole system of communism that caused untold suffering to those people is based on evolution. The, the solution to fix Russia's problems is creation evangelism. Get the gospel in there and bring in the idea there's a creator. See, we had people come to America, the immigrants came to America for you know hundreds of years, and many of them brought with them what's called a Protestant work ethic. There's a God, I shouldn't steal, I should work hard, I should, you know, I should get the fruit of my own labor. The harder I work, the luckier I get. And that Protestant work ethic, as it's called, says, look, just work hard, don't steal from anybody, do right, and, you know, eat the fruit of your own labor. Drink water out of your own cistern, the Bible says. Okay, we have to do a quick break here. We'll get into more on how communism and evolution tie together. And this will take quite a while as we go through the ten planks of the Communist Manifesto and the eight rules of revolution that the communists have for taking over a country. And we're going to get bogged down on some of these, I am sure. But feel free to ask any questions uh, if you'd like. Okay, quick break. All right, let's explain a little bit how communism, humanism, uh, Marxism, named after Karl Marx, and evolutionism tie together. By the way, I do a lot of debates, and they always say it's creationism versus evolution. You ever notice that? <laughs> I say, no, no, it's evolutionism versus creation. I always put the ism on evolution on purpose. Um, this fellow said, do humanists believe in a supreme being? Emphatically, yes. That supreme being is man. Humanists have no knowledge of any being more supreme. They will call themselves an agnostic. They will say, I can't prove there's no God, I just don't know. Agnostic is from the Greek word where we get our word ignoramus. <laughs> I don't know. How, how, appropriate. how appropriate, yes, agnostic, ignoramus, okay? I don't know. And guys like Huxley would not claim to be atheists and a lot of you know, professors today would not really claim to be atheists, they would claim to be agnostics, which means they just don't know. So make that a quiz question. What does agnostic mean? Don't know, or ignoramus. <clears throat> Either one would be sufficient there. Um, in the American Humanist magazine, this fellow said, the turning point in history will be the moment man becomes aware that the only God of man is man himself. Now watch this philosophy carefully because this is exactly what is spreading around our United Nations that man is God. And you're going to see the worship of Mother Earth or the worship of uh, environment as probably the world religion coming soon. What's happening in the United Nations is scary because they really have this idea. There is no God, therefore, you know, we must be it. So we will get together and decide and vote on right and wrong. Um, the communist uh, ACLU, I jokingly call it the American Communist Lawyers Union, started by a guy named Roger Baldwin, who said very clearly the goal of this organization is to further communism. 
That's what the ACLU started for. So I call it the American Communist Lawyers Union. Um, <coughs> that's their stated goal. We covered that a little bit more on videotape number one of our series. Karl Marx, originally named Moses Mordecai Marx Levy. You're not going to have quiz. No. But when he was 17 years old, he wrote a beautiful paper telling how much he loved the Lord. In order to graduate from high school, you had to give your testimony or something to that effect, and so he wrote great paper. Then Karl Marx went off to college, and in college his philosophy was destroyed by a professor who turned him in, uh, on to the pre-evolutionary ideas. You know, this was just before Charles Darwin wrote his book, but evolution was rampant before that. You know, Darwin just gave a mechanism for how it can work. See, Darwin is only famous for supplying the mechanism. A lot of people already believed in evolution. They didn't know how it worked. Darwin said, well, it works by natural selection. Oh, brilliant idea. Yep, we'll take it. That was basically what happened. So you can't say evolution started with Darwin by a long shot. Karl Marx later said, <clears throat> My objective in life is to dethrone God and destroy capitalism. Now, as we study Karl Marx here for a few minutes, everything that he did from this time on in his life was anti-Christian. If God was for it, he was against it. And you won't understand his ten planks of the Communist Manifesto, and you won't understand the Communist mindset until you see how evolution ties in. So when was he alive? I don't know when he died, but in mid-1800s, okay, he wrote his manifesto, and Brian and I were just arguing about this today, was it 1846 or 1848? Uh, one of the dates, the date on our website is right, the date in my seminar, it's one of my slides is wrong. I think it's 1848 uh, is the correct date, but I'll, I'll look it up and check it out. One atheist said, you shouldn't trust anything Hovind said because he got the wrong date on something, you know. Oh, I said Congo was taken over by Belgium in 1880, and it was 1885. Therefore, everything else I say is not good. <laughs> That's the kind of thinking these guys have, you know. Anyway, uh, this uh, professor, uh, E.O. Wilson, is a uh, biologist at Harvard University, has taught for four decades. He said, as were many persons from Alabama, I was a born-again Christian. When I was 15, I entered the Southern Baptist Church with great fervor and interest in the fundamentalist religion. I left at 17 when I got to the University of Alabama and heard about evolution theory. And now he has been destroying students for 35 or 40 years at Harvard University to come through his class. And just about every kid that goes to a secular university, even University of West Florida here, in the middle of the Bible Belt, you know, Pensacola, Florida, there will be at least one professor who thinks it's his duty in life to destroy that kid's faith going through school. And a very high percentage of kids get their faith destroyed going through school. Professor Wentworth, Wentworth, he said, When I entered Harvard in the fall of 1924, I was not only a Christian, I was also an avowed candidate for the ministry. Then for four years I underwent a process of mental readjustment which shook my little world to its foundations. Through it all, only one thing was clear to me. If I could reconcile religion with intelligence, I knew that I could go on into my chosen career fortified by the experience. If I could not, every consideration of honor would compel me to make other plans. In the end, I gave up the ministry. College education turned him away from serving God. I got a letter just last week, two weeks ago. Uh, this fellow said, Dr. Oven, until I went to college, my faith in God was sound, but my college history class helped to destroy that faith. I started to doubt the Bible and God's Word. I even started to doubt Jesus was truly God's Son, and that He died and rose from my sins. My best friend showed me your tapes, and I was in awe of what I saw. Everything I thought I knew about life was changed. Praise God. But how many, right now, tonight, while we're sitting here, how many hundreds, and th hundreds of thousands of students are doing homework for a college class that is destroying their faith, and their insides are just being eaten up with this doubt because some professor gave him a hard time all day today, and nobody has given him any ammunition to teach the truth. I am so convinced this evolution theory is not just dumb, it's, it's dangerous. What happens, Satan is using this theory, to, of course, to keep people from hearing the gospel. Many people refuse to even listen. 
And I tried to witness to my brother's best friend, Mike, who lived just next street over from us when I was growing up. I tried to witness to Mike, and he was uh, going to college in, in Peoria, Illinois there. And he started teach it, telling me all about evolution. He said, I'm sorry, I, you know, I don't need your gospel, I don't need your Jesus, because, you know, I'm going to college, you know. Evolution is how we got here. And I just, I couldn't get anywhere with him. I was a brand new Christian myself, you know, sophomore in high school, and he's a sophomore in college, and I, I didn't know how to witness to it. That was one of the events, I guess, in my life that caused me to start getting interested in finding an answer to this, you know, because this evolution theory is, is hindering folks from coming to listening to the gospel, for one thing. Those that are already saved and then go off to college like these guys and get their faith destroyed end up being unfruitful. The professor here, uh, Wentworth, for instance, he's, he's going to heaven. He's going to be there with all of us. But how many folks is he bringing with him? Probably none. What about Wilson, the biologist at Harvard University? How many souls has he led to the Lord, do you think, in the last 40 years? How many could he have led to the Lord had somebody not destroyed his faith at Alabama University, University of Alabama? The Bible's real clear on this, you know. Matthew 18, 6, you know, you better be, if you offend one of these little ones that believe in me, you'd be better off with a millstone hanged about your neck and drowned in the depth of the sea. This is a serious offense. Um, interesting quote here. Uh, Christianity has fought and still fights and will fight science to the desperate end over evolution. Because evolution destroys utterly and finally the very reason Jesus' earthly life was supposedly made necessary. Destroy Adam and Eve and the original sin, and in the rubble you will find the sorry remains of the Son of God. Take away the meaning his, of his death. If Jesus is not the Redeemer who died for our sins, and this is what evolution means, then Christianity is nothing. The American Atheist Magazine, 1978. And they're right. If evolution is true, Christianity is nothing. Jesus died on the cross for no reason. He's just another martyr for a cause. This battle... Now, I want you to notice what this guy said. Now, he's writing this in the American Atheist magazine, okay? Look back at the first sentence here. Christianity has fought, still fights, and will fight science to the desperate end. No, no, no. We don't fight science. We fight evolution because we feel it's not part of science. But even in his quote, you know, you can see the trying to sneak evolution as part of science. <laughs> evolution is not part of science. Evolution is a fairy tale. It's a religion that people believe in because they don't like the other alternative. But from the book uh, uh, video, Let My Children Go, which is tremendous, um, they said in there, 75% of children raised in Christian homes who go to public college and public schools will reject the Christian faith by their first year of college. 75%. I remember my first day in sociology class at Illinois Central College. I was a little scared anyway, you know, first day in college, you know. High school's a little more secure. You go to college and it's just kind of a whole new world. Here we are in sociology class. This fellow with real long hair, growing around the fringe and bald in the center, going to be our teacher for the class. He said, okay, students, uh, are there any Christians in the room? I raised my hand. He said, what's your name? I said, uh, Ken Hoven. He said, Mr. Hoven, so you're a Christian, huh? I said, yes, sir. He said, well, tell me, uh, can your God do anything? I said, yes, sir. By the way, that's not true, okay? God can't learn. He already knows it all. Uh, he can't lie. He can't do anything. He can't sin. But I, I didn't know any better, so I said, yes, God can do anything. And he said, well, uh, tell me, Mr. Hoven, can God make a rock so big he can't lift it? Now, this guy already had it planned out, a whole sequence of questions to ask to destroy any Christians that came through his class. He'd been doing it for, for years. There are professors in just about every university that have this mentality that it's their job to destroy any kid that comes through their class, destroy their faith. They're out there. The woods are full of them, okay? Those guys get, ought to get an honest job picking peaches or changing tires instead of destroying some kid's faith as he comes through their class. By the way, can God make a rock so big he can't lift it? You're dealing with infinity here. I've learned how to answer the question now. Jesus often answered a dumb question with a question instead of an answer. I now say to him, you know what a line is? 
you know, in geometry, I taught geometry for years, a line is going forever in both directions. Never stops. They'll say, yeah, I know what a line is. Okay. A ray, this is a line, a ray goes forever in one direction. Starts at a point, goes forever in one direction. And they'll say, yeah, I know what a ray is. I say, okay, which is longer? Well, they're both infinite, okay? <laughs> Neither one's longer than the other. And as far as, you know, the rock and God, God can make a rock. I, I, all I could say at the time, I said, well, I said, God can make a rock so big you can't lift it. Which is still true, by the way. Now you can. But there's so many kids. I mean, we get letters and calls here. I don't know how many emails I get. Probably close to 100 a day. Uh, uh, probably more than that. Martha filters do a lot of them first. But it's unreal how many folks write us and call us or... Uh, sometimes they're, they're crying on the phone so hard they can't even talk because our, our tapes give them back something that the professor took away when they went to college. You see that all the time when you're out speaking, you know, it's just like, wow, I wish I'd had this information 10 years ago, you know. Uh, because this is the center of the battlefield right here. This evolution theory is Satan's favorite tool to destroy people. Karl Marx based his philosophy of communism on evolution. Now, he was already thinking up these theories. Marx never worked a day in his life. He was a loser. Okay, he was a he was a bum. He was a moocher. Okay, a, a leech, sucked the blood out of everybody else. Never worked a day in his life. A guy named Ingalls, a rich guy from England, kept supplying him money, so that Marx could think and write his theories. Marx was an absolute loser. Okay, he had six children. Three died of starvation in infancy. He wouldn't work. Didn't have any grocery money. Kids died of starvation. Two others committed suicide. Not a very successful father, I would say. Only six people attended his funeral when he died in 1883. <coughs> when Darwin's book came out, Marx read the book, wrote a letter to Ingalls, and said, Ingalls, this book by Charles Darwin is perfect to justify our theories of communism. This book takes away the need for God. Therefore, man is God. See, you cannot have communism and Christianity. They, they don't coexist. They can't. The two philosophies are mutually exclusive. Either there's a God that decides right from wrong, or man decides right from wrong. Karl Marx wrote the Communist Manifesto. I have the date on here of 1848. I believe that's correct. The one on the website is the correct one. I'll, I'll, I'll fix this if this is not right. But he had ten planks. Ten things that he believed. We'll go through one by one here. I'll give you plenty of time to write these down. His first plank of the Communist Manifesto was abolish private property. And we'll probably ask you on the quiz to pick any three or four, and maybe some bonus if you can list more, uh, of the planks of the Communist Manifesto. These are ten ways to destroy a capitalist country, to destroy a Christian nation, and establish communism. See, now Peter, you were raised how long under Soviet Union? Eight years, okay? And your family for generations back before that, right? Um, communism doesn't allow you to own private property. Finally, I don't know when, 1950s or something like that, so many people were starving under the communist work program. You know, they had these huge collective fields, you know, this 10 billion acres belongs to the government. Everybody go out there and work all day, you know. Who wants to go work on a field they're not going to get any result from? So even today... A huge percentage, I heard 70%, it may be more than that, or close to that, of the food raised in Soviet collective farms never makes it to the table. It's either not harvested, oops, we forgot to harvest it, so it rots, or it's harvested and stored in huge piles and the rats eat a bunch of it, or the birds, they just store it in big piles because it's not privately owned. If any, anybody that's ever owned a house and rented it out to somebody else will understand what I'm talking about. <laughs> okay? The owner has a different attitude toward his property than the renter does. In just about, there are rare exceptions to that, but that is certainly the rule. Okay, there may be exceptions. Under communism, you can't own property. 
finally, when so many people were starving, they, they, they had to modify communism a little bit and said, okay, everybody can, you can plant food only in your own little yard. And when I was over there, when you were in Ukraine, I suspect same thing, you know. People's little bitty front yard and backyard is loaded with vegetables. And they grow more stuff in a third of an acre <clears throat> than the communists can grow on 10 acres. Because that's theirs. They're going to take care of it. Um, they were having debating on the radio here in Pensacola years ago about Hillary Clinton's health care plan. We ought to have universal health care. This guy's on the radio bragging about how good this would be. Man, everybody ought to have coverage. And they always have some sob story, you know. Some little old grandma in Arkansas doesn't have any health care, and, you know, she needs a surgery on her eye, and she's going to go blind. And I'm sure there's a lot of people suffer, okay? No question, right? But the, the, the philosophy is what I want you to get here. And they'll say, see, we ought, to, we ought to have coverage for these folks. And they were bragging about how good it would be to have universal health care. So I called into the radio station, like I do from time to time. I said, hey, fellas, uh, I forgot to change oil in my car. And uh, I blew the engine. No, it's not true, but I made up the story to see what they would do with this, you know. I said, I think everybody in Pensacola <clears throat> should help me pay for a new engine. If everybody chipped in, it only cost about a quarter apiece. No, no big deal. And the announcer said, hey, if you forgot to change oil in your car, that's your problem. We shouldn't have to pay for a new, in new engine for your car. I said, exactly right. Now let's go back and look at the health care issue. 70 to 80 percent of all health care costs, you can ask any doctor, 70 to 80 percent of the costs are from self-induced problems. They smoke, they drink, they take drugs, they live a wicked lifestyle, they don't take care of themselves, and when they get sick, they want me to help pay for it. That's exactly like saying, look, I don't want to change oil in my car, I don't want to take care of my car, but when it breaks, you've got to help me pay for it. Well, that's flat stupid, okay? If we had universal auto care, anytime you need new tires, the government will buy them. Anytime you need a new engine, the government will buy them. How would you drive your car? <laughs> you drive it bad enough now, son. I'd hate to see it then. How many of you have had your dad yell at you for leaving the lights on or leaving the water running too long? Just about everybody, right? Why? He pays the bill. He pays the bill. Why aren't you worried about leaving the lights on? You're not paying the bill. <laughs> That's exactly right. Let's have universal house care. Government pays all utility bills. Would you worry about shutting the door and leaving the air conditioner on? When the AC's on and it's hot outside, you would stand in the doorway and talk to your friends for hours at a time, wouldn't you? Because you like that nice cool breeze coming by. <laughs> the thought would never occur to you, you know, this might cost me at the end of the month. <laughs> that thought would never enter your mind. And with health care, the dumbest thing we could do would be universal health care. Because then people already don't, don't take care of their health. It would be much worse. Much worse. If somebody wants to drink alcohol, that's their business. If they want me to pay when they get sick, now that's my business. People say, don't you feel sorry for them? Yes, I do. But if, if suppose nobody was allowed to have health insurance. First place, costs would come way down. When my son back there got his, his ingrown toenails cut out six or seven times, finally the doctor said, I'm sorry, this isn't growing right. We're going to have to remove the toenails, the big toenails. I said, okay, doc. So we scheduled a time for surgery. He goes in for surgery. He's in there for an hour and a half. They put him to sleep, take off the toenails, bandage him up, go home. We get the bill. Anesthesiologist, $1,500 for putting him to sleep for an hour and a half. The room he sat in, the, you know, they did surgery in. I forget what it was, like $1,000 or $1,200 or something like that, you know, for an hour and a half. So I get all these bills, you know, no insurance. Total like 4,500 bucks. My wife can give you the details. I got these bills. I sat down, picked up the phone. I called the anesthesiologist. I said, listen, uh, I'm a Christian. I pay my bills. But I just am having a hard time understanding $1,500 for an hour and a half. I mean, I got a doctor's degree too. Uh, I don't charge $1,500 for an hour and a half's work. 
The guy said, yeah, you're right, that's kind of high, let's make it 500. I didn't realize you didn't have insurance. Over the phone. Never have met the guy. Still haven't met him. Dropped it from 1,500 to 500. Called the doctor or the people who owned the little clinic. It wasn't even a hospital, a little outpatient thing, you know. $1,200 for an hour and a half. I know you've got to change the sheets and, you know, get to buy some new bandages and stuff like that, but, uh, you know, that's a little high, don't you think? He said, yeah, you're right, let's make it 400. We didn't realize you didn't have insurance. If nobody had insurance, medical costs would drop dramatically. I'm not saying insurance is good or bad, okay? I'm just saying the fact is when people have it, costs go up and people take less care of their health. That's what communism does. First plank is abolish private property. The Bible's very clear. Leviticus chapter 25, verse 10. And you shall hallow the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. It shall be a jubilee unto you. And you shall return every man unto his possession. What's happening here? Anybody able to know the story in Leviticus? What was the law they set up? How is it supposed to work? If you, lost, if you lose your property, everything. you get it back in 50 years. Let's suppose, you know, dad's a drunk. The family loses everything. They know in 50 years they're going to get their inheritance back. So, if you're having hard times, you can't pay your bills, and you want to sell five acres of your property, you can sell it to your neighbor until the year of Jubilee. So the neighbor's going to think, okay, we've got seven more years until he's going to get the property back. How much crops can I go on that land? That land is only worth X amount of dollars because I can only have it for seven years or for 15 years or for 25 years or whatever it is. And they would prorate the value of the land based upon how long they're going to have it because they know they're going to have to give it back. Ownership of private property is essential to freedom. Suppose in Soviet Union, you're not allowed to own property. What's your incentive for working? I, I hope you saw it when you were there, but I saw it. The lack of a work ethic. And now that communism, communism has not collapsed, by the way, but now that they're giving the appearance that it has, a lot of people simply don't know how to work. They know how to stand in line. They know how to have the government provide for them. But they don't you know, work for myself. You know, the mafia has just done horrible things over there. And the black market, you know what's happening in Ukraine and in Russia, all oh, because of this thing. In 1 Kings, chapter 4, the Bible says, And Judah and Israel dwelt safely, every man under his vine and under his own fig, his fig tree, from Dan to Beersheba. This, in the Jewish mind, is the idea of everything's fine. I got my own vine, I got my own fig tree, I got my own property, I'll take care of my family. Freedom is impossible without ownership of private property. And I taught my kids from the time they were a little bitty, if this toy, you know, I see some parents, well, you better share your toy with your brother. I really thought about that long and hard. And I said, yeah, I do want my kids to share. However, I also want to teach them property ownership. I'm sorry, Ken Andrew, that is Eric's toy. You better learn to negotiate with him or deal with him or offer to trade him or be nice to him or ask to borrow it. But I'm not going to force him to share his toy with you. That's his toy. I guess to me the property ownership principle was important to get into my kids. And I see kids get spankings, you know, because they won't share. Well, I don't know if I'd say, I guess you're getting borderline communism there, you know, <laughs> making them share. It's, hey, it belongs to him. He don't want to share it. That's his business. You know, I'm disappointed you don't share it. However, it is yours. Do with it as you please. And even in my own family, we each own our own cars. If my son wants to borrow my car, or if I want to borrow his car, we have a mileage rate. Otherwise, there's hard feelings. How many parents, the kid borrows the car, drives it around, uses up all the gas, and thinks he does dad a favor by filling up the gas tank. Well, that's only one-fourth of the cost of operating a car. You know, what about the tires you wore out, you know, 1%? Or the, eventually the transmission is going to go bad or <laughs> something. You know, all these expenses catch up with you at once. And the fact that you drove it 400 miles to grandma's, you may not see that expense now, but I will see that expense, you know, in a few years. Something's going to wear out. Certainly you're going to depreciate the value of the car. Buy a $20,000 car. Drive it 200,000 miles. How much is a car with 200,000 miles worth? Zero, right? You put them in the junkyard. Yeah. 
So just depreciation, you went from $20,000 to nothing. That's what, 10 cents a mile? It's just depreciation. It costs 10 cents a mile, just depreciation. When you look at a car and you're going to buy a car, it says 1996 Ford Mustang, 50,000 miles. Wow. 1996 Ford Mustang, 150,000 miles. What does that do in your thinking to the value of this car? Well, guess what? It dropped one mile at a time. <laughs> the more you drive it, the less it's worth. That's just plain and simple. So, private property ownership is essential. Karl Marx said, no, you have to take away private property. Communism won't work if people have private property. Our founding fathers had a philosophy in this country. Life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness was the slogan. Now, that was a mistake, okay? The original slogan was life, liberty, and property. Property ownership. The whole principle behind being able to defend yourself is the fact that you own your body and you can defend your body. If somebody breaks into your house to do harm to you and you shoot them, you're fine. Audubon Society, the president, Peter Burrell said, we reject the idea of private property. Well, this guy has a communist mentality, whether he knows it or not, whether he understands it or not, he's thinking like a communist. Here's a pledge some mother sent me from her third grade class in Massachusetts. The kids had to color this. I pledge allegiance to the earth, which I do love and depend on, and to all life on land, air, and sea, which is as much a part of the earth as me. We're teaching kids that the earth belongs to everybody. It's not fair for you to own your own property. And the whole idea behind the slow encroachment of government requiring permits for all sorts of things, you know. Man, our founding fathers 200 years ago would have started a war. I mean, I've got to get a permit. I've got to get your permission to build my house. <laughs> Forget you. <laughs> this is my property. That was so strongly ingrained in them, and that now is being, is being weeded out. You're seeing it building your house how many permits you have to get. And we're seeing here in our ministry, which is under a church, not a 501c3 corporation, a church, and we did not get permits when we built our buildings. And they give us a hard time. They don't understand. Well, we're going to help them understand. You simply have no authority over a real church. And 99% of the churches in America think that they're real New Testament churches, and they're not. They're, they've asked the government for permission to exist. They become a 501c3 corporation. That's not a church. You're a brand, you're a, it's like in Soviet Union, there are two kinds of churches. The free church and the state church. Most churches in America are state churches and don't even know it. We'll get into more of that later. All right, next week we'll talk more about communism and the philosophy and how it's so dependent on the theory of evolution. And it'll take us quite a while to get through communism, maybe the next uh, 20 classes, I don't know. But we're going to see some things that are very politically incorrect, including why none of you have any money. We'll get into that later on. Thank you so much. See you next week.